Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. The great essayist, poet, and philosopher, T.S. Eliot, posed these two very important questions over half a century ago. Yet, they apply more today than ever. What he pondered was, where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Join me today as we search for those answers and many more on this episode of Between the Lines. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com. Whenever I do my show, no matter what the topic is and whether I'm talking with one of my guests or even now as I'm talking directly with you, my aim is to create an enriching experience for us all with special attention paid to uncovering some type of insight that's of benefit. Today I want to approach three different topics that I believe fit that bill. The first, as I indicated in my open, will be to look for wisdom in the age of information. The second is to explore if change is truly the only constant in life, and if it is, why do we have so much trouble dealing with it? And the third is about finding our purpose. Now, we all know that each one of these topics by themselves can fill an encyclopedia, but I know that if we even just dip our toes into these waters, we undoubtedly will go much deeper over time. Now, we all know that we are living in what is called the age of information. Never in the history of humankind has there been available so much information with such ease. With the click of a mouse, the touch of an icon, a word typed in Google, or a simple question to Siri, if she understands your New York and New Jersey accent. We can have at our fingertips almost all the information ever accumulated since the beginning of time. Now that alone may be one of the greatest leaps humanity has ever experienced since the invention of the printing press. And we inevitably can feel a sense of awe because of it. Awe itself is very difficult to find. And its meaning over time has it even changed somewhat. For the most part, awe is described as a mixture of emotions, one of reverence, respect, fear, and the one I like best, wonder. And Socrates stated, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. I wondered, how am I going to involve all of you in this process? Although I still have lots of things to work out, the first thing I want you to do is visit my website, barrykibrick.com, where you'll see some options on how you can participate. Now, the world-renowned psychologist Abraham Maslow, in his paper called A Theory of Human Motivation, talked about wisdom like this. People generally recognize that wisdom involves an integration of knowledge, experience, and an understanding that incorporates the uncertainties of life with all its ups and downs. In other words, it's basically self-realization, or if we go back to Socrates, it is to know thyself. But I have got to level with you. Knowing thyself is as difficult on one level as finding wisdom, but that's a topic for another day. 
Now, according to Peter Rudin of Columbia University, a renowned psychologist, he defines wisdom like this. Wisdom is different from intelligence. Intelligence seeks knowledge and seeks to eliminate ambiguity. Wisdom, on the other hand, resists automatic thinking, seeks to understand ambiguity better, and grasps a deeper meaning of what is known, but also the comprehension that there are limits of knowledge. That's very interesting. It's to know that there is, in a weird way, think about it, to know that wisdom is the ability to realize there's only a limit to how much knowledge you can really have. I, I found that uh, to be something I'd love to hear your take on. Now, one of my absolute favorite descriptions of wisdom was summed up by the British journalist and broadcaster, Miles Kington. He said it like this, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it into a fruit salad. Now, I took a very bold move and created what I believe is a definition to describe wisdom. And it goes like this. It's developing a deeper understanding of our world and universe and a greater appreciation for our role in it. And I want to put that emphasis on a greater appreciation for our role in it, for that is our purpose. More on that in the third segment. But what makes wisdom so important? What is its true value? And what gets in our way from attaining it? Those are the things I'd like to hear from you about. So again, please visit me at barrykibrick.com, share your thoughts, and hopefully I will have figured out how you can do that by the time you see this. But before we change to our next topic, which is change, I believe I might have a suggestion to what blocks our own way from obtaining wisdom. I think for most of us, it is getting past the notion that we don't already have it. And that's something we have to change. Change. They say that change is the only real constant in the universe. Yet so many of us have problems dealing with all different types of change, both positive and negative, and both some that we control and some that happens to us. When it comes to change of any kind, it just can't feel as comfortable as those old pair of jeans you never changed. And this by no means is a new feeling. To quote the philosopher king Marcus Aurelius, who realized this in 150 AD, he said these words, the universe is change and that our life depends on what our thoughts make it. Our quest, however, has to be not in just our thoughts, but how we can truly develop ourselves from the changes we experience. The slightest, slightest little change can really be something that drives us. And I want to look at that and drive a little deeper and look at why change for so many is so hard. Now, psychologist James Prochaska believes that it's not so much that change is the problem, but it's our perception of change. Now, obviously, much of it is based on our past experiences and how we deal with it. In fact, these perceptions even stop us from making the changes we even want to make. I have to admit, I'm a perfect example of this. Overall, I get very excited about change. I love the challenge. I love the new things that may occur. I even love the uncertainty. Yet, when all I want to change is the simple thing to lose a little weight, the barriers go up. Yes, I'm sure a few years of therapy can fix the problem, 
but so could a few less calories per day. Now, I know this, and it's not because I don't have the willpower. And I know it's not willpower because just this year, I lost over 25 pounds. It's just that I did so by losing a pound a week and then gaining a pound a week. At least I broke even. Now, how do I understand why this is so difficult? Well, according to Mona Fishbane, who is also a phenomenal psychologist, she writes this. And she even says this is what they call the anatomy of a habit. Billions of neurons in the human brain. Each neuron connects with up to 10,000 other neurons, resulting in trillions of synaptic connections. And these interconnected neurons become circuits that underlie our habits. Now, for the record, it's always better in life to blame neurons than haagen -Dazs. But the true secret is neuroplasticity, or as my guest a while back, physicist Dr. Leonard Mladenov called it, elastic thinking. In his brain, and this is what he believes truly, and he writes it in his book, Elastic, these words. Elastic thinking is what endows us with the ability to solve novel problems and to overcome the neural and psychological barriers that can impede us from looking beyond the existing order. Now, in fact, in recent years, scientists have made amazing discoveries that the adult brain, not just the child's brain, is also very plastic, very changeable, very malleable. We can learn and grow, changing our brains in the process. In fact, this goes on throughout our entire life. And it turns out that the experience not only changes the connections between the neurons, it affects the expression of our own genes. Genes are turned on or off by experience and environment. That, think about it. Think that just what is going on, change itself, can affect our genes. Now, the truth is, I cannot fit into my genes just yet, and actually had this discussion with my son the other day. Instead of using my elastic mind, I find it easier to buy jeans with elastic already in them. My son, however, put an end to the discussion when he simply said, Dad, do you have no dignity? Well, hopefully I have just enough. Because another past guest on my show, Gary Zendersky, in his book of Zen, quotes an old Chinese proverb. When the wind of change blows, some people build walls while others build windmills. Think about that. Change is coming. Do we wall it off or do we flow with it? Gary adds that it's a beautiful metaphor for how we can approach transitions with either resistance or purpose. Yet he too admits most of us are resistant. And the reason he writes is this. It takes a while to get things just the way we like them. There is comfort in consistency. And when life is predictable, there are so many fewer things to have to worry about. When we create the perfect routine where we can absolutely know what will happen next, the last thing we want to do is upset that pattern. <sighs> wow. Yet deep in our hearts, we know we have to upset patterns if we want change and even if we want to get past that resistance. And oftentimes, the best way to disrupt patterns is by doing so in a way that seems like no change is occurring, or if it is, it's happening at a very much slower rate so that it feels more natural. Now, Dr. Robert Maurer, also a past guest on our show, 
has helped countless of people and organizations reach their objectives and maintain excellence by using a very unique technique that circumvents the brain's built-in resistance to new behavior. He calls it the Kaizen way, how one small step can change your life while sidestepping many of the roadblocks. He writes these words, while the steps may be small, what we're reaching for is not to commit your life to honoring and maintaining health, to the passion and excellence of career, to the pursuit of rewarding relationships, or the continued upward revision of your personal standards. It is to strive for powerful goals, often elusive and at times frightening. But for now, all you need to do is take one small step. So when you think of it that way, change still has quite an allure. And as Gary Zendersky writes, and the spirit of change is often the messenger of hope. We will seek and embrace change when our hearts tells us there is nothing amiss with our now. And then Gary adds, and I believe this too, and I hope you will as well. We live best when we are drawn to our heart's calling, where we navigate towards some personal vision or goal that calls to us and somehow feels like home. Then change actually becomes the wind in our sails, and once we know where we're headed, change will be our companion until we arrive. And that leads us to our next chapter, how to find that purpose so we can fill our sails with plenty of wind. And share your thoughts about this at barrykibrick.com as we sail on to our next topic, purpose. Purpose. That's one of the most challenging things for us all to kind of figure out. What is our purpose here on this planet? The question has been asked again since the beginning of time. Why do we exist? We must at least understand that there is a purpose to our existence. Even the great physicists who may be the ultimate atheists who believe in nothing existing outside of the universe still knows that there is something that transcends the state we're in. And oftentimes that in itself is what we're here to do, to figure out what that is. So we're born almost with a purpose. Whether we realize it or not, we have a purpose. At first, it was simply to procreate. Then as we grew and we developed agriculture and we developed farming and we were able to start to think instead of just survive, our purposes kept shifting. And now we're at a stage where people are very nervous if they don't seem to know their purpose, their mission. One of my guests, Sir Ken Robinson, states this about purpose in his book, The Element. It's all about discovering your natural aptitude and personal passion, doing something that feels so completely natural to you, that resonates so strongly with you, that you feel that this is who you really are. But I couldn't think, and I couldn't help think, about after I finished the book, I was wondering simply this. Do you find your element or do you create an openness so it can find you? That's one I'd really like to hear from you about. The other thing has to deal with aptitudes and abilities because you can't just go silly willy into your passions. You have to know what are your abilities, what are your aptitudes, because they are part of your raw potential. 
abilities are developed. Hidden depths, you may not know all your aptitudes, but they may also lie latent and uncovered within you. Anyone, from artists to sanitation workers to sewer workers, from accountants to teachers and secretaries, all can experience being in their element. One of the main themes of Sir Ken's book is that we all think differently. Finding your element brings purpose to your life. It's about enhancing the balance of your life as a whole. Making a living at it, well, that may be another thing. While not everyone can become financially rich through their element, everyone is entitled to be enriched by it. Now you might say, what if I have no special talents? What if I have no real passions? What if I love something I'm not good at? What if I'm good at something I don't love? What if I can't make a living from my passion? What if I have too many other responsibilities and things to do? What if I'm too young? What if I'm too old? These are questions that we all ask ourselves and we must find the answers. We must experiment with this on a one-on-one -on -one process. I'm certain when you do, we and you, me and you, will figure it out at least some of it. However, the obstacles and frustrations experienced along the way are probably our biggest problem. That's why Winston Churchill said, Success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Wisdom is a personal quest, a two-way journey to explore what lies within and an outward journey to explore the world around you. It means asking yourself, stop what you're doing and think, and to stop yourself from fearing the change. Stop yourself from fearing if you have passions because you have to move toward your fears and not away from them. And that is what is important. One key thing is to turn down that voice in your head that tells you you're not doing it right. That negative noise that can change your perspective. This one not only has taken me most of my life to accomplish, but I'm still in training. But here are some things you can do right now to find your purpose, feel that wisdom, and get through all the changes. Know your life is unique. You do have a mission even if you cannot find it. Remember, it just might find you. I'm Barry Kibrick. Whether you feel that there is a mission that you can find, whether you feel there is a purpose, whether you feel that you can exist without change or with change, whether you feel yourself being torn apart by not feeling as wise as you should, realize that those are things we all feel. That is what our common consciousness is all about. Fear of change, fear of being smart enough, and truly a fear of finding our purpose. But we shall do it together, and I thank you for joining me on this special episode of Between the Lines. As I told you earlier, by the time this episode airs, I will figure out how we can truly communicate about this episode in order to share our thoughts with each other. I plan on expanding this throughout the year so that we can actually have online discussions. But for now, here's what I came up with. After the episode airs on your favorite PBS station, it will be posted on my website at barrykibrick.com and also on my YouTube channel. Under the episode, you will see a place for comments. I'll post the first comment, and hopefully others will join in the conversation. 
We talked about the topics of wisdom, change, and our purpose in life. And I know my viewers, and I know you all have something to either ask or comment about on any or all of those topics. And if you have a very personal issue that you want to talk with me about, you may also write me directly at Barry at BarryKibrick.com. That's Barry at BarryKibrick.com. And I promise you that I will respond to every single post online and every single email you may write me. So please take part in this experiment. Who knows what wisdom we'll uncover together. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to BarryKibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at BarryKibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses. From podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more. With tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com.